This is Max Allen Collins. Please stick around and help me solve the incredible mystery of Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Milt Larson, founder of the world-famous private club for magicians, The Magic Castle in Hollywood. He's also the author of a new book, My Magical Journey, The First 30,000 Days. Now stick around, because if you don't, I know guys who can make you disappear just like that. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience that includes my late Uncle Abe, who taught me everything I know about making quarters appear from behind the ears of pretty girls in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Who doesn't love magic? Now, whether it's a simple sleight of hand that your uncle used to demonstrate with cards or coins when you were a kid, or big dramatic stuff like making the Statue of Liberty disappear, what adult isn't stopped in their tracks by magic? And we can all name the best known magicians, of course, starting with Harry Houdini and on through David Copperfield. There have also been some great TV shows such as The Magician with Bill Bixby and even Bullshit with Penn and & Teller. And who could forget the star turns by Tony Curtis and, 30 years later, Paul Michael Glazer, both as the great Houdini. But the most enduring name in magic is probably the one that few of us has ever actually accessed in person, the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Now, Milt Larson founded the Private Club for Magicians some 50 years ago, and it's still thriving today as a place you might run into magicians or magic fans such as Steve Martin or even Neil Patrick Harris. And just this week, word leaked out that a major motion picture about the Magic Castle will be directed by McGee. And even better, new and now, not new, now, coming to us live from the Magic Castle is its founder, Milt Larson. Milt, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi, Mr. Media, and how are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm, uh, this is almost like being there. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, this is it, the Magic Castle itself, yeah. right? Well, it's a great place, and it's very unique in the world of magic. You're actually in the world of anything. And let's start with the room that you're in. Tell us about uh, this room. I know it's special. Well, this room is the Invisible Irma room. And Invisible Irma, the story goes, we don't have a lot of verification on this, but this, the story goes, uh, she was a part of the uh, relative of the owner of this old mansion, and the house was built in 1910. And apparently she passed away sometime in about 1938. But she used to be playing the piano up in the tower of the castle. The castle is the Victorian mansion with a tower. And they didn't think she played too well, so they had her play up in the tower. And uh, when we took it over in 1963, uh, we found that strange things happened. So that yeah. was kind of weird. Now. Uh we can just, Milt, you can hear me okay, right? Yes, perfectly. All right, so we'll pick it up from there. Now, it's interesting. You were just telling us about um, about Irma and how she used to play piano, and then some strange things happened, and very strangely, we lost our video connection. Now, you know, you're starting to creep me out a little bit. 
<laughs> well, Invisible Irma does odd things. People say, video. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I, uh, you know, it's good talking to you all the way from Florida, but, uh, you know, I can't. Uh, I can't tell you what happened. But I guess when that happens, uh, you know, she she plays the piano here every night. And people request songs, and they'll, they'll say, "Play Swanee River." She plays Swanee River. Not that many people ask for Swanee River these days. But that's, <laughs> that's our fault. You know. So it's a lot of fun. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that Irma and, just Irma does not want us to talk about uh, her. So maybe we'll maybe we'll change the subject and see if we have less trouble with the video. Or, well, that was weird. <laughs> there you are. That was weird. All right. Well, let let, let me let me change the topic, and maybe Irma will let us uh, move through with our video. Um, <laughs> that yeah, was, but, you know, get rid of those things. It might, might help. That was really strange. So, um, uh, the uh, this this uh, the castle, the house that the converted house that you're in, it's over a hundred years old. You're coming up on the fiftieth anniversary of the, uh, right. the castle itself. Okay. Of the opening of the castle, which is, uh, at the time we opened the castle, the building was only about 50 years old, so, <laughs> so we've grown up with it. Did you ever imagine that it would be become such an enduring landmark and, uh, you know, so famous? Not really. Uh, my late brother and I, uh, we were both in the television business. I was a writer and he was a producer at CBS. I was at NBC. Uh, we didn't have a third brother. We could have covered all three networks, but the, uh, uh, we just really were brought up in magic. And uh, uh, my mother and father, we were the Larson family of magicians. And we loved magic and uh, kind of got the idea to do it. I met the person that owned this property, a gentleman by the name of Tom Glover. And uh, he liked the idea, so he had no idea what to do with it. So, building and at that time it looked kind of like the uh, it fell out of the Adams family uh, you know I mean it, it, it was uh, the weeds were in the, in the front lawn and uh, and the paint was chipping and it was really kind of a kind of a sad old uh, mansion and it's it's a block from the uh, Roosevelt Hotel uh, and the uh, Robin's Chinese and everything, so it's in the heart of Hollywood. But uh, it was still a, a leftover old house in the middle of development, you know. So, so it made sense to us to, since it looks so much like a haunted house, we figured we'd haunt it with a bunch of magicians. And uh, Bill, Bill and I were both very, very involved in, in magic, uh, uh, magic societies, and my dad had. Uh, started a magic magazine back in 1938 and all the magicians knew my dad and we lived in Pasadena at the time and they'd come visiting and so when I was a little kid I, I got to meet some of the greatest magicians in the world but being a little kid I didn't appreciate it I, you know Cardini and people like that came over to the house and oh hello Max Bellini they're, they're great names in magic but uh, now I wish I'd paid more attention to them but you know, I'm a little kid. What do I do? Maybe, I have a pick. Maybe, I have a pick. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Maybe you can get some. Maybe you could uh, have a séance and get some of them to come and and haunt the castle on a regular basis. They do that quite often. Uh, we have a room in the castle called the Houdini Séance Room, uh, and, and that is all the Houdini memorabilia from uh, uh, everything from his uh, famous uh, trunk mystery. The uh, where they change places in, in the truck and uh, is a uh, uh, milk can escape. We have the original milk can, the original truck. And it's a wonderful picture in the Houdini room of my uh, myself, a little eight-year-old kid doing a coin trick for Mrs. Houdini. <laughs> and, and here I am uh, showing Mrs. Houdini how, how to do magic. But that was a long time after Houdini had passed away. And, my dad was Mrs. Houdini's attorney, among other things. Really? Interesting. Yeah. I, 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 it's a little off the topic, but I had a fellow on a few weeks ago on the show who is writing the Houdini, the Harry Houdini Mysteries now. It's a, oh, great. It's oh, that's a, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a series of novels that uh, takes place when Harry is a young man, 
And mm-hmm. uh, before he's the world famous Houdini. In his head, he's the world famous Houdini, but the reality is the world doesn't know him yet. But he's using uh, all That's kinds of That's a great idea. So it's going to be a TV series or a novel? Uh, it's a series of novels, actually, yeah. Oh, cool. That's great. Uh, uh, Harry, you know, Harry, uh, uh, a year ago, that this is October or November, but the, uh, a year ago at Halloween, we had a very serious fire here at the castle in the attic of the old home. And uh, it happened to be on the anniversary of Houdini's death. And uh, he died in 1926 in Detroit. And almost exactly the time that he died is the time that the fire department said the fire started. And it uh, is very strange because it, it was a very serious fire. It uh, caused us to be closed for about uh, almost three months. but. Uh, Houdini didn't particularly like a fellow by the name of Dante, the magician. And that room underneath where the fire started was pretty much totally destroyed. And uh, Irma down here, now Irma was a ghost, so he, he liked Irma, so this room wasn't touched. <laughs> but that room was, and the strange thing is the Houdini seance room, which uh, you would think would have had some damage, and out of all the damage caused by the fire, the Houdini room didn't have anything. So he gets a little spooky around here, Bob. You know? Well, <laughs> it's and, weird. and I noticed that since we stopped talking about Irma, the video's been perfectly fine. Ah, uh, you see? That's it. And probably Harry Houdini's enjoying the conversation because you mentioned him. He was a, <laughs> ego uh, was kind of his tradition. I mean, he, he knew he was the greatest magician in the world. And uh, he kept trying to prove it, but uh, uh, the publicity of Houdini long after he died, people still know Houdini, oh, sure. and you know they don't know a whole lot of those people from a couple hundred years ago. So. Well, and it's funny, people who don't even know who Harry Houdini was necessarily, they know that the term Houdini means magic or escape or oh sure, it, you know, it, it's, he it's, pulled a Houdini, you know that many he got out of jail, you know. Exactly. I mean, it, it survived his, even his legend. It's just, you know, it's bigger than he was. Oh, yeah. No, he's an amazing fellow. I, I, uh, you know, he died in 1926. That's long before my time. But I would have loved to have met him. And I suppose we will sooner or later, you know. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the castle. Um, did you, when you, op- when you and your brother opened the castle, did you envision it, you know, in New York, the comedians have the Friars Club and you know mm-hmm. a- actors have places was it was it something like that that you had in mind or well pretty much uh, it was a fraternal organization uh, for magicians and uh, when we first started we understood that because we did want to put in a bar and a restaurant and and have a, more of a night clubby type of thing even though it was a private club and uh, we realized that magicians alone could not support of what we had in mind, so uh, we also opened the club to people uh, who just love magic, love watching magic. And today we have about uh, active membership of about five thousand people all over the world, and primarily in Southern California, of course, because they use the club. But the uh, but it, it was at, at the time we opened there was the Maskers Club, which was a theatrical club. Of, uh, the Friars Club out here, which has uh, since closed, but uh, uh, so yeah, we we definitely had in mind something like that. But both Bill and I had no clue of what we were doing. I mean, it, honestly, we had no business plan. We had no idea. Uh, Tom Glover, the owner of the property, uh, gave me the key and said, "Have a good time," and I did. <laughs> and I've been having a good time for the last fifty years. And I. Tell it. We've talked a little about the. You've talked a little about uh, Invisible Irma and the piano. You talked about the Houdini Seance Room. Uh, tell us about some other parts of the castle. That uh... well, basically, when you, when you enter the castle uh, and you check in with the receptionist, and you notice in the reception room, uh, you came in through the front entrance, but there are no other doors, so that's a little weird, and. Uh, so to enter the castle, uh, you might talk to a little hologram, a little 17-inch man that uh, hangs out here, and then he asks you to go over. 
say open sesame to an owl that resides in a bookcase. And right out of the old Abbott and Costello pictures, the bookcase slides open and you enter the castle. And that's the first step in making adults feel like children. <laughs> and that's part of the, the secret of the castle. So when you come to the castle, you don't think about anything but how the magician's going to really fool the pants off you. And, uh, and so you enter the grand lounge of the uh, castle, which is the original grand entrance to the old house. And uh, in there you find a, a very elaborate uh, bar from the turn of the century and uh, carved woods and chandeliers. And, it's everything you'd expect in a millionaire's mansion from the turn of the century. And uh, from there you go in and see possibly Irma. There's a close-up gallery that is a huge theater where they do intimate magic. They're a huge theater, it seats 30 people. But, uh, but the people are very huge. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a very, very intimate room and that's one of the great things about the castle is the close-up magicians that will do tricks right in front of your eyes. And uh, that's just one of the rooms. And then uh, from there you can go up the grand staircase and there you'll find a beautiful uh, dining room. Actually, there are five dining rooms, but the, the one in the middle has got a stained glass dome ceiling. It is quite grand and there again it uh, goes back to practically when the house was built. Actually, the dome goes back to before the house was built. But the, uh, uh, we, we pride ourselves in having wonderful dinners, very uh, Victorian service, uh, although we keep up with the times. You know, we don't do uh, total Victorian. And uh, so you can dine and relax in the dining rooms, and then from the dining rooms, you go into another area of the castle, which are the showrooms. And the biggest theater of all the theaters at the castle is a 135 seat theater, which is a stage theater. And there you find illusionists that do the big things. You know, if you want somebody solid in half or stick swords through them or whatever, you do, make them float in the air. That's a real fun thing to do. And, uh, but that's the big magic. So you go from the close to magic to the big illusions of stage things with pretty girls and boxes and dancers and all that stuff. And in between is a theater called the Parlor, the Parlor of Prestidigitation. And I coined that word and I wish I'd never done it because I, half the time I can't even say it. <laughs> parlor, parlor of Prestidigitation. But at any rate, but that is the stand-up kind of thing. A lot of comedy magicians, that would do it. but that's a little 70 seat theater. And then we have another theater, the Power Theater, which is named after a magician, but uh, it's a, another 50-seat theater. So there's uh, the W.C. Fields Lounge, which actually was the uh, bar from the film Hello, Dolly, you know, originally. And uh, if you remember that film, there was this grand carved bar and uh, Water Matthew uh, slid down majestically as they were throwing him out. But, uh, uh, at any rate, everything in the castle, I've always said it's like a museum of the Cleveland Wrecking Company because a lot of the parts of the castle came from other old mansions, you know, that were being torn down at the time and we go out and save pieces of old buildings and put them in here because when we originally took over the building, it was very, very plain. It had been just kind of stripped of all the... Uh, goodies that would normally go with a house like this. There was only one original chandelier and I'm sitting under it right now in the Irma room. But uh, that was the only chandelier in the whole place. Now we have I think I don't think chandeliers. I'm, I'm, I won't go up and count them right now. Okay. No, but it, there's a lot of them. Park glass windows and stained glass. Other houses would be torn down so we just take these beautiful windows and replace a plain window with a beautiful carved window. So, and everything about the castle is, there isn't an inch of the castle. The castle is 22,000 square feet of castle. And uh, it's every place you look, there's something that will uh, be of interest. Well, I, I have to tell you that we, we the two of us have yeah, to have... 
I'm sorry. Uh, you and I need to avoid mentioning the name of the woman who plays the piano. Mm -hmm. Because every time her name comes up, the video cuts <laughs> out. That's true. Her I, I, she doesn't. Don't, don't say that name again. <laughs> uh, let, let's, let's just call her the invisible piano player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, has technology affected the castle much in 50 years? Has it changed things there? Well, we try to ignore it. But uh, uh, we have to admit that, yes, it does exist. And uh, we do everything we can as modern technology. And that goes for everything technically. But we try to cover it with something that looks like it would have come from another era, because magic itself uh, has that aura of uh, of mystery that it kind of comes with, you know, caves and dark places and people with cloaks and, and weird things. When we first opened the castle, we, we in California have to post a notice of intention liquor license, and we put a notice of intention on our front lawn and uh, front lawn at that time was a bunch of weeds I mean, we to, to serve all fishing cars. Well, at that time, flower children and hippies were all the rage and the entire neighborhood was in an uproar because this bunch of evil witches and, <laughs> and people were going to come in and take over the world to prove to the various schools and churches around here that we're really a bunch of nice magicians right. that do show, shows for children and things. So, <laughs> so we got open and ever since then they've been very, very cooperative. All right. Now, uh, tied into the uh, the upcoming 50th anniversary, there's a lot of new stuff happening with the castle, starting with this, uh, this agreement that you have now with CAA to represent the right. brand. Now, are we going to see, uh, will this lead to magic castles in other cities or magic no, stores? Uh, or what, what, what is this going to mean? What, what it means, we're, we're very sensitive to the fact that we don't want to be a McDonald's on every street corner. Uh, what it does mean is there might be a, another magic castle, let's say in Paris or in London or Bobby, San Francisco. We love San Francisco. And there's a plan afoot right now with a very close to making a deal for a Magic Castle licensing agreement with a group in uh, New Orleans. So that would be a perfect place for Magic Castle. So we're not planning to do hundreds of castles all over the place because it's hard to duplicate. And the other thing is we don't want to imitate the castle. We want to do everything that people love about the castle. The magicians are the main thing and do it in an atmosphere that will be just as interesting as the castle is in another place. It might be in a high-rise building, who knows? But uh, uh, that's one of the things. And then there's also a great deal of the branding of the name because we've achieved a certain amount of uh, international importance, the Academy of Magical Arts and the Magic Castle, which is the clubhouse. But people all over the world know about the Magic Castle. They, they want to come to Los Angeles and they want to see Disneyland and then uh, the Magic Castle. I look to a treasure. Everyone can go to Disneyland, but nobody can come to the Magic Castle because it's a hard ticket. You can't get in, and we've been playing that game for 50 years. No, you can't come in, but we're packed every night with people that somehow figured out how to get in. So I, I can't tell you the magic secret. Magic secret is to call you in Florida and say, I know somebody at the Magic Castle. But at any rate, that's part of it. And then there's also many things that we're doing. There's a, uh, investigating the video games and uh, 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 all the possibilities of what do you do with the concept of a, a bunch of magicians. You know, that's what we are. And uh, there's a movie uh, in the mill now with uh, 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 using the castle as a place. And say, well, what's that going to be? It's going to be, uh, no, it's not going to be a variety show. It's not going to be a tour of the castle. It's going to be uh, people coming out. I can't tell you what the plot is because, quite honestly, we don't know. The writers are working on the thing. We know the theory of it. And people get kind of lost in the castle. And walls might turn into places that you never expect. 
You might go from a room at the castle into some planetary thing. We don't know. And nobody will know until the picture comes out uh, really what we have in mind. And that's because the writers are two of the most imaginative writers in the business. The director is Matt G, who right. is very, very well known for his incredible grasp of fantasy. And I think that's what it's all about. The whole castle is like a, uh, it's, I've, I've likened it from time to time, like it's uh, Alice in Wonderland. You know, we, we let people come in our front door, they say open sesame, and all of a sudden they go through that little door and uh, they're in a whole different world and they can't quite figure out where they are. And they will not figure out where they are because a bunch of magicians are fooling them every time they turn around. And finally, at, you know, California laws, we close at two o'clock. And at two o'clock, we put these poor souls back out on the streets and they have the real world to contend with. And that's awful. You know. <laughs> go, back, go back into the magic castle and lose your... Uh, you, we're, we're the perfect escapist place to be. You know, if you want to escape reality, just come to the magic castle and watch the magician. And we'll send you back when you're ready. Okay. And will it, if there are magic castles in New Orleans or San Francisco or somehow I guess Orlando might come up, um, will it be easier to, to gain admission to those magic castles than it is to the original? It would depend on, there might be a situation where it would be more of a magic themed club, uh, which wouldn't be a private club. That could happen. Uh, on the other hand, it could be a pretty much what it is, and then the Academy of Magical Arts might have a chapter of a private club that would meet in a building such as this one. So this is the clubhouse for the Academy of Magical Arts, but it doesn't mean that everything we do with the Magic Castle is necessarily tied into being uh, private. You know? So part of it will undoubtedly be open to the public, uh, depending on whoever wants to talk to CAA or whatever deal they put together. We're all ready and willing to do it. We've got, uh, about, I, I mentioned we have 5,000 members, and about half of them are magicians. Magicians will be happy to go any place and do their magic for you. We have, uh, through the current licensing agreement, we have magicians working in a theme park in Japan. And uh, we've, we've always been doing a lot of uh, marketing of uh, licensing of the name. We do uh, my own show. We we do a show uh, called It's Magic. And uh, uh, that started actually before the castle. It's in its 55th year. And it plays up and down the West Coast in a, it's an all-star magic review. But we've been doing that forever. That's that. But it's, it's all Magic Castle magicians. And so the name Magic Castle kind of is a blanket term that covers about anything in magic. And if you want to have magic, just uh, remember the Magic Castle because that says it all. What's a Magic Castle? It's a place where the magicians hang out. That's about it. And would, uh, you know, would, would Harry Potter be entitled to an honorary me membership at the castle? Would he be able to get in without, you know? Well, he would now. Uh, Original, the original Potter books, he would not be able to get in because he wasn't 21 years old yet. <laughs> and, and actually, the author was barely 21 years old. But the, uh, uh, we do have a, a rule here at the castle for uh, you have to be 21 or over to be a member. And that's mainly because we do have five bars and, and you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a party every night here at the castle. But uh, we also have a junior group at the castle, which the uh, AMA has, the academy, and that is limited to magician, uh, young magicians with exceptional talent that just haven't reached the age of 21 yet. And so they work together, and the minute they become 21 years old, we have almost every one of them will have their 21st birthday at the castle. I'm legal, I'm legal. <laughs> I like that. So, all right, but, uh, so, before, so that's about it. But before we have to let you go, I need to ask you about your book. Uh, it's just oh, just published, yeah. uh, My Magical it, Journey, The First 30,000 Days. 
Um, right, we figured that out. We, we took my age and figured out how many days there were. So it was roughly 30,000. We kind of narrowed it down to that. Close. And, and uh, it's a book not so much on the castle itself, but it's a fascinating story about a kid that was born to a magic family. My dad and mother and my brother were the Larson family of magicians, and he was an attorney that gave up being an attorney to go on the road with the family of magicians. And uh, uh, so all my life I've been involved with magic, and I like it. And it's the reason it's called the magical journey is it's like I'm on a train track, and the main track is magic. But during that life, I've also uh, been involved. I've opened a Mayfair Music Hall in Santa Monica, which was a British music hall. And then I had a place in downtown Los Angeles, Variety Arts Center and Theater, that we created that. I did Caesar's Magical Empire in uh, Las Vegas, which is a ground up. We found a city underneath Rome and rebuilt it in Las Vegas. And then, of course, the castle. So, and uh, I've got a lot of really strange things, but it all comes down to almost everything I've done has magic involved. I was a writer on a Bob Barker's Truth or Consequences, and I was a writer on that for 18 years. And one of the reasons I kept that nice job was because I brought magical acts in, not, not magicians doing magic, but using magicians' tricks. We did reunions. And we might sell somebody in half, and one half would be the uh, service man's long lost ride, or whatever it happened to be. So, magic has always been part of my life. And I, uh, I think uh, the magic of all of that. that uh, my, after my 30,000th day, I have no intention of retiring. We're going on to open other castles and do all these wonderful things. And, uh, you know, it's a very exciting life, and uh, I hope to be around a long time doing my particular kind of magic. Well, I think we would all like that, and uh, I hope that'll be the case. Um, well, thank you. My pleasure. And, uh, folks, listen, you can find My Magical Journey, the first 30,000 days by Milt Larson, uh, mm -hmm. exclusively right now at the Magic Castle uh, bookstore, or the Magic Castle mm -hmm. itself, or you can find it uh, at the website, magiccastle.com. Just uh, go to the store, and you'll you'll find it right there. Eventually, it should be available at Amazon.com and other uh, online places. If I if I understand that correctly, you got it, and that is what it will be. And uh, we'll probably go into an ebook sooner or later. But right now, it's hot off the press, and it's I really pride myself in having fun and humorous writing abilities. It is not a serious book at all. If you want to know about this Netwit kid that grew up in magic, it's a fun book to read. So, Well, uh, Milt Larson, uh, just an honor and a pleasure to get to meet you. Thank you so much for having us into your castle. And uh, thanks Well, for, thank you. Thank you for being a guest on Mr. Media today. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun from this side, too. Thank you. All right. And thank you, Irma, for letting us get through to the end. <laughs> 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 All right. Take care. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin, Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, the TechCrunch headlines, and the Don Geronimo Show. 
The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, BlackBerry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout.